Welcome. Um, this is the inaugural lecture of Open Lectures on Freemasonry. I'm Susan Mitchell Summers, a collaborator of the Open um, LFM and professor of history, and I'm tonight's chair. Open FLM, it's hard to say, is an independent, informal, and benevolent initiative with no connection to any Masonic body or scientific institution. Our project is intended to make research into Freemasonry more visible and accessible through digital technologies. The main aim of the initiative is to gather distinguished scholars, such as our speaker tonight, um, of Masonic research and create a common online ground between these scholars and interested audiences. Please follow our website, www.openlfm. Uh, Dot org for forthcoming lectures. We are currently planning to record lectures and make them available uh, in the future from YouTube, SoundCloud, and our website. Please share this information, share the website with, with anyone you think might be interested. We're beginning our monthly lecture series tonight with Andrew Prescott, uh, Professor of Digital Humanities in the School of Critical Studies at the University of Glasgow and formerly Director of the Center for Research into Freemasonry at the University of Sheffield from 2000 to 2007. After Andrew's presentation, we will have a few minutes for questions. Please use Zoom's chat feature to submit queries at OpenLFM host. Also, as a favor to both Andrew and myself, uh, please state your questions in English uh, to eliminate the need for translation. We've disabled your microphone and the raised hand, hoping to keep the time use very efficient. I hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. Andrew is going to speak to us on research in a time of coronavirus, resources and opportunities. Andrew? Thank you very much, Susan. It's, this is the biggest Zoom I've done yet. I've been doing a lot of Zooming during the period of lockdown, but this is the biggest one I've done so far, a lot of you. But weirdly, I've got no idea who's out there. I can only see, I think, probably the people who logged in first. I've got Claudio on the screen, and I've got Neil on the screen. So hello to Claudio and Neil. Um, but um, I, I, for everybody else, good evening. Um, I'm very, very honoured that you're out there, very pleased uh, to be with you this evening. And it's a, a very great honour to be asked to inaugurate this series of open lectures on Freemasonry, the way in which so much of our social and cultural life has moved online during the current COVID-19 crisis is remarkable. And it's fascinating to see the study of Freemasonry also joining the Zoomiverse with such enthusiasm who ever would have thought the Quattro Coronati Lodge would have a YouTube channel, but it does now. For me, there's no doubt that the most frustrating aspect of the current lockdown is the closure of libraries and archives. Ideally, um, I would spend every day of my life um, in a library. And that's why I've chosen as my Zoom background um, the reading room in the British Museum, where I spent many happy days, um, because I think with these Zoom backgrounds, one's really saying where you'd rather be, and that's where I would rather be. In fact, of course, I'm currently locked down in Wales. I'm in the small village of Clonon on the west coast of Wales. And uh, if, oh, um, here we suffer the issues of the, uh, that's what I need to do. This is where I am, Clonon, very pretty place. It's a good place to be locked down in. Uh, uh, on the west coast of Wales, and that's where I'm speaking to you from tonight. And it looks as pretty as that tonight, in fact. Clonon is a 30-minute bus ride south of Aberystwyth, the small seaside town which claims to have the most books per head of the population of any town in Britain. This is because it's the home of the National Library of Wales, which you can see here, where I usually spend my days when I am in Wales, but which of course is now closed until further notice. However, the National Library of Wales, like other libraries, is continuing to provide access to its digital resources during the current crisis. 
And indeed, for the history of Wales, we are very well served digitally. The National Library has digitised all journals in both Welsh and English published in Wales, and all these Welsh journals are freely available online. Similarly, the National Library has digitised all the newspapers ever published in Wales, and these are also freely available online, and they are a rich and underused resource for the history of Freemasonry. You can just see um, from these heads uh, of the search in the Welsh newspapers for Freemasonry, mixture of stuff in Welsh and English, but you can see um, you get a lot of hits uh, just on that one straightforward search. To give you just a quick flavour of the material in Welsh newspapers online, in 1804, the ancients began a vigorous campaign to promote Freemasonry in South Wales. This was spearheaded by Benjamin Plummer, a merchant based in Bristol and London, who was a keen Masonic Knight Templar and a member of the Baldwin encampment in Bristol. There's a lot of interesting correspondence in the Museum of Freemasonry in London about Plummer's sometimes overbearing and controversial activities in introducing Freemasonry in Wales. And the digitized Welsh newspapers add to our picture of Plummer. In November 1808, the consecration of the Glamorgan Lodge number 33 under the Ancients Grand Lodge at the Cardiff Arms Inn, the, the inn famously associated with the well-known rugby ground, um, was reported in the Cambrian newspaper. Here's the report. You can see it here. The Ancients Grand Lodge, the paper said, was convened in Cardiff under the authority of the Duke of Athol as Grand Master of Masons in England and by permission of Thomas Harper as Deputy Grand Master. Well, this report almost immediately prompted an angry letter um, in the Cambrian with George Bowen, uh, the master of the indefatigable lodge under the moderns in Swansea, protesting that Athol was not Grand Master of Masons in England and pointing out that Thomas Harper had in fact been expelled from the Premier Grand Lodge. That led to Plummer writing back to the paper, affirming that the meetings of the Glamorgan Lodge were legal under the terms of the 1799 legislation regulating the Sonic meetings. There'd been some discussion in a Bristol paper as to whether the whole proceeding of the ancients in Cardiff um, was illegal. Well, this is just a little exchange um, in the Cambrian newspaper, but I think it illustrates how um, tensions between ancients and moderns could look on the ground during the period immediately before the union of the two Grand Lodges. I think we sometimes forget how many flashpoints there were between the ancients and the moderns uh, in, in the provinces in England and Wales. And this little exchange in the newspaper uh, nicely illustrates how very fraught the rivalry between them could become. So for me, what helps to soften the lockdown is that I can continue to explore primary sources like these newspapers online. The academic study of history is rooted in the critical examination and exploration of documents, texts and artefacts dating from the period being studied, what we call primary sources. These primary sources are the raw material of history. Wider narratives are valid only insofar as they are grounded in a critical and reflective analysis of the fullest possible range of primary materials. This may sound a very positivist approach, but it isn't. The reason our conversation about history is open-ended is because there are always new things to say about our primary materials and there is always unstudied primary evidence to be explored. In Britain, I would suggest that the golden age of research into the history of Freemasonry were the 40 years between 1880 and 1920. This was the period when modern professional methods of historical study relying on detailed analysis of primary documents were emerging. And Masonic researchers, particularly those associated with the newly established Quattro Coronati Lodge, enthusiastically engaged 
with these new methods. In 1885, Henry Sadler's Masonic Facts and Fictions used the minute books and membership registers of the Ancients Grand Lodge to disprove the claim that the ancient had split from the modern's Grand Lodge and showed that the ancients were formed by Irish migrant masons and others who hadn't been allowed to join lodges under the Premier Grand Lodge. William James Hewham traced dozens of manuscripts of the old charges and drew attention to the extent and importance of evidence for Scottish Freemasonry before 1700. John Lane produced a list of the dates of foundation and meeting places of Masonic in England based on documentary evidence rather than traditions. Alfred Robbins led a systematic search for information in 18th century newspapers about the early history of Grand Lodge and found important and surprising new evidence, such as this report that in June 1722, members of the Grand Lodge met Lord Townsend, the Secretary of State, to assure him of their loyalty to King George II. The work of scholars like Sadler, Hewan, Lane and Robbins laid the foundation for the great partnership of Douglas Noop and Gwilym Jones at the University of Sheffield during the 1930s and 40s, which produced perhaps the most important single body of Masonic scholarship in Britain. All this work was driven by an energetic and enthusiastic exploration of primary sources. It's my fervent hope that the availability of so many digital resources like the Welsh newspapers online will encourage us all to start exploring more widely primary sources that relate to the history of Freemasonry. It's disappointing to me that too often the internet is used to distribute poor quality versions of ancient publications by discredited writers like George Oliver or John Yarker. Let us give up trying to create online Masonic libraries and instead start exploring original contemporary documents and artifacts. My aim this evening is to give you a little taster of some of what is available online. In particular, some repositories, such as the National Archives here in Britain, which are currently closed because of the coronavirus, have made available free of charge some digital archives for which you would normally have to pay. So there's a real window of opportunity while we are all in lockdown to take forward the investigation of the primary sources of the history of Freemasonry. I must apologize that much of what I will show you will be focused on Britain, but I hope you'll still get some idea of what is possible. Here in Britain, Oh, sorry, I would have, uh, I should have uh, um, uh, uh, had another slide in there probably because I wanted to pay tribute here in Britain to the work that the Museum of Freemasonry uh, has been uh, doing and uh, the way in which it's been at the forefront of making resources available for the study of Freemasonry. I should have had a, a nice picture of their overall website there, but I went straight on to what has been their major contribution um, which is that all the membership records of the United Grand Lodge of England are available on Ancestry.com. That's an amazing, an amazing achievement. Here are the entries for our evangelist of Freemasonry in Wales, Benjamin Plummer, and uh, shows you the, the way in which information about Plummer's membership is readily available. And here um, is an entry in the membership registers for an even more famous Freemason, Winston Churchill, so the second one there, marked with an arrow, reminding us as well that he resigned the craft quite quickly, um, uh, joined in 1910 and left by July 1912. These online membership records are a fantastic resource, but unfortunately, we have to pay for genealogical resources like Ancestry and Find My Past, and they aren't cheap. I usually get round this by going to the National Library of Wales, where I can consult Ancestry for free on the library computer. But, of course, I can't do that at the moment. But the Museum of Freemasonry has another marvellous resource available on 
online, which is free, and which I think we should all be using much more intensively. Masonic Periodicals Online is a comprehensive, searchable archive of the major English Masonic journals and newspapers from 1793 to 1906. Masonic Periodicals Online provides a wealth of contemporary reports on developments in Freemasonry during the 19th century. And again, this little illustrative page, I think, shows how it enables you very easily to follow through contemporary reporting the development of the rift between the United Grand Lodge of England and the Grand Orient of France in the 1870s. The Museum of Freemasonry's own catalogue is in itself an enormous digital resource. And I think we forget or haven't noticed sometimes how much digital material is available simply via the catalogue of the Museum of Freemasonry. The catalogue includes hundreds of images of Masonic jewels, aprons, engravings, photographs, and increasingly artifacts. Um, such as um, uh, these two jewels, which I hope you can see and the, the, um, uh, the, the pictures haven't uh, uh, blocked them out. Two jewels made by uh, Thomas Harper and an apron, which belonged to Sir Christopher Cole, who was the Conservative former naval officer, landowner and member of Parliament, who, to Benjamin Plummer's great chagrin and annoyance, became Provincial Grand Master of South Wales after the Union in 18, 1817. So the Museum of Freemasonry here in, in Britain is doing a great deal um, to promote digital uh, resources. And recently, um, it's made available another marvelous uh, uh, resource, um, which is its first online digital edition, a facsimile of a remarkably wide ranging and interesting manuscript compiled by William Perfect, um, the physician, actor, and poet who was provincial grandmaster of Kent uh, towards the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And um, that's there for you to explore um, as you wish. So there's a lot from within the Masonic archive already available online, but much of the most interesting work by researchers such as Alfred Robbins uh, was uh, beyond the Masonic archive. It was, for example, um, investigating evidence of the early history of Grand Lodge in newspapers. Newspapers are one of the types of historical source whose use and accessibility has been transformed by digital methods. In Britain, the British Library's major collection of 18th century newspapers, the Burning Newspapers, was one of the first source collections to be made available online. The digital Burnie collection has already produced much fascinating new information about the early days of Grand Lodge, such as um, this denunciation of James Anderson's 1723 book of constitutions, which appeared in the Daily Journal on the 25th of January, 1723, apparently placed by the London bookseller, James Roberts. Roberts declared that, the extravagant length of Anderson's constitutions, exceeding that of four ordinary sermons, makes it most evident that they are calculated at the expense and damage of the society merely to serve the interest of one single member, the author, whose assurance was such he got them printed off before he offers them to the general censure of the fraternity. Roberts assured all lovers of pure masonry abstracted from innovations and self-interest that a much cheaper and more accurate publication of the constitutions would shortly appear. Roberts's previous publication of the Old Charges in 1722, which is what he regarded as the cheaper and more authentic and shorter version of the constitutions, had already caused a lot of bad feeling with advertisements being placed in the newspapers warning brethren that Robert's Book of Constitutions was false and spurious, nor does the said book contain anything like the true constitutions of the society that is calculated to deceive the public, whereof we desire the brotherhood to take notice. 
All this suggests that the process surrounding the compilation and adoption of the 1723 constitutions was much more contentious than is usually assumed. And it's a wonderful illustration of the rich information uh, about the history of Freemasonry, which can be found in early newspapers. However, unfortunately, the Bernie newspapers and other major packages of early British newspapers, such as the British Newspaper Archive, are commercial products. The cost of the Bernie newspapers is such that only university libraries can easily afford to offer access, and a further personal subscription um, is necessary for access to the British Newspaper Archive. And you can see how if you, if you went and took out all these subscriptions, um, they would soon mount up to a considerable amount. There are some excellent free newspaper archives available for other countries, such as Trove in Australia, a fantastic resource, and the Library of Congress chronicling America for the United States. But I think it's very sad that for Britain, for early British newspapers, we're dependent entirely on these commercial packages. So I think what I want to try and emphasize really for the rest of my talk um, is how there are still many free resources uh, that you can uh, explore. You don't need to be locked out by the fact that these things are commercial packages. The British Library's selection of digitized manuscripts, uh, which contains over 4,000 manuscripts, um, include complete online facsimiles of two 15th century manuscripts, which record claims by medieval masons that their craft reached back to ancient biblical times and that their meetings were authorized by kings ranging from Nimrod to Athelstan. These are the Regius manuscripts, which you can see here, which is so called cool because it's in the collection of royal manuscripts in the British Library. And that's the, the version of the old charges that's in the form of the poem. And here, the Cook manuscript, which is named after the cantankerous organist, writer, and Masonic enthusiast, Matthew Cook, who first published it in the 19th century. These are the foundational documents in a way of Freemasonry, and uh, although they've been closely studied, there's still a lot I think we can say um, about them. And these digital facsimiles of the complete manuscripts of the British Library give us a chance to explore details of the manuscript at our leisure. But the digital resources of great institutions like the British Library aren't restricted to medieval manuscripts. The British Library contains the UK's National Sound Archive, including many oral history recordings referring to Freemasonry. A large number of these are available for you to listen at home, including, for example, on the, on the side detail um, uh, in this slide, um, the reflections of a Smithfield meat porter um, on the value of Freemasonry in society. It's quite a nice and um, eloquent statement about the social role of Freemasonry. So uh, some, as you ferret around somewhere like the British Library, there are unexpected and um, surprising um, uh, finds that you can make uh, which can take forward our understanding of Freemasonry in society. One of my favourite free digital resources for research purposes is the British Museum's Collections Online, which contains records for more than 4 million objects in the British Museum collection. Um, you could easily see how you can get lost in this database of collections for a very long period of time. Um, and uh, includes here, as you can see, a wide range um, of material on Freemasonry, uh, which range from these quite spectacular prints by the Swedenborgian enthusiast and promoter of the Scottish Rite in England, Pierre Lambert de Lintot, published in 1789, to a humbler, but I think no less entrancing, ticket for Masonic subscription concerts in Freemasons Hall in 1783. And this was designed by uh, Giovanni Cipriani and engraved by Francesco Bartolozzi and also includes artifacts. And given that the documentary evidence for provincial Freemasonry can be patchy, particularly in the 18th century, artifacts can be important and interesting pieces of evidence, such as this painted tumbler 
decorated with Masonic emblems, which is from Newcastle and dated 1768. The British Museum also administers the Portal Antiquities database, which contains nearly one and a half million records and images of objects discovered by users of metal detectors and others, things found in the ground from all over Britain. This uh, portable antiquities database contains a number of items supposedly connected with Freemasonry, which are sometimes puzzling and definitely deserve further research. For example, this metal badge was found with a metal detector in a field in Cornwall in 2015. It has an inscription, an inscription, quote, in everything be true to the king, with king spelled K-I-N-G-E. This badge is claimed in the catalogue of the database as Masonic because it's alleged that the phrase uh, in everything be true to the king um, occurs in Masonic charges with that same distinctly spelling for king. The object apparently dates from the 17th century. If it really was Masonic, a 17th century object like this would be quite an interesting find. But it's surely more likely that it's simply a royalist token from the Civil War. Who could say more research is required? Um, it illustrates how we can find a wide range of material as we go around these databases. Other museum collection databases are happy hunting grounds for Masonic objects. We are sometimes told that Freemasonry was in the doldrums in England in the 1750s, but this seems to be contradicted somewhat by this spectacular object in the Victoria and Albert Museum in the British Mu in, in London, um, a beautiful Masonic ring which was made in England between 1750 and 1770 and incorporates tiny Masonic emblems. It's probably difficult to make out, but um, I think you can make out at the very bottom of it, uh, the trowel, the small trowel. And above that, um, there's a rule. And uh, if you look very hard, you can see that the design also incorporates a square and compasses. And again, because this questions perhaps our view of Freemasonry in the middle of the 18th century, uh, this is an object which isn't textual, but can uh, challenge and question some of our narratives. Now, because I work on the history of British Freemasonry, um, I, of course, tend chiefly to use British resources. But, I mean, the beauty of digital resources is that they're potentially international and resources from other countries are also very beguiling to explore. Uh, one that never disappoints for me uh, is the Gallico resource of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, which is always very rewarding, even if you're looking for material uh, on Britain. Uh, the, the scope of the collections is such um, that uh, there's always fascinating material. But as I indicated earlier, the point I really want to get across this evening is that some institutions are making digital sites for which we would normally have to pay available for use free uh, during the period of lockdown, which is I think, a definite silver lining to the lockdown uh, clouds. In particular, the National Archives in London is making a number of its pay for resources available for free while its buildings are closed in the current emergency. In order to uh, take advantage of this, you have to register for an account uh, at the National Archives, which is very simple. Um, and your total free downloads are limited to a maximum of 50 items over 30 days. So you have to kind of watch, watch you don't go over that. Among the records that the um, uh, National Archives are offering free access to are wills from the Prerogative uh, Court of Canterbury which is one of the most important of the various courts in Britain which administered wills. These wills are a very rich resource for researching Freemasonry and individual Freemasons. So a lot of information in there. And normally, uh, the National Archives charges you £3.50 to download each will, so that soon mounts up. If you have an Ancestry subscription, you can uh, use an unlimited number of wills uh, but you, you do need an ancestry subscription. But 
while the National Archives is closed, subject to that restriction of 50, which you could easily uh, mount up, we've got free access um, to these wills. There's a great opportunity there. We can investigate the wills of those who called themselves Freemasons in medieval and early modern England, such as this example, Stephen Burton, who called, describes himself as a citizen and Freemason of London, who died in 1488, and whose will throws some sidelights on the London Company of Masons in the 15th century. Burton was a prosperous man whose possessions included pearls set in silver and tapestries. He left a bowl set in silver and gold to the Freemasons in London. He specified that the tools and instruments pertaining to his craft should be divided amongst his apprentices and stipulated that any goods or money left in his estate after his bequests should be distributed among poor women of the craft in London. Apart from exploring early, early operative masonry, you can also download wills of prominent Freemasons, such as the will of William Preston, the author of Illustrations of Masonry from 1818, which I show here. Preston's bequests included £300, the interest of which shall be applied to some well-informed mason to deliver annually a lecture on the first, second or third degree of the order of masonry, according to the system practiced in the Lodge of Antiquity during my mastership, the foundation of the famous Prestonian lectures, which continue to this day. Preston's care of his Masonic writings is apparent from his instruction that, quote, my scattered manuscripts on Masonic subjects may be delivered over to Stephen Jones of Red Lion Passage Fleet Street, none of which to be published unless it be such as I may arrange and mark for that purpose in my lifetime. Many other distinguished Masonic figures appear in the wills which you can currently download for free from the National Archives. Peter Gilks was a very influential Masonic teacher from around the time of the Union and played a key role in the development of emulation ritual. His will from 1833 is striking for the way in which his Masonic artifacts are listed. These included a Masonic jewel presented to him by his London pupils in 1822, another Masonic jewel presented to him by his Lincolnshire pupils in 1825, and three Masonic tracing boards which hung above the fireplace in his room. Another fascinating Masonic will is that of William Finch, a tailor from Canterbury, who became a bookseller specialising in publicising Masonic material and consequently fell foul of Grand Lodge. Finch's work was, however, very influential on the reform of the ritual at the time of the Union. His 1818 will is a very elaborate document designed to try and ensure that his Masonic bookselling who continued to support his wife and children. He leaves his Masonic plates and lectures to his wife and children and assumes that the continued sale of these lectures will support them. In particular, he was very anxious about the education of his children, even specifying what books they should receive at that age. So before you lose, use up your 50 free downloads in 30 days from the National Archives on downloads of Masonic wills, it's worth looking around at some of the other records which they're making currently available uh, for free. It's quite a wide range. In particular, I think it's worth looking at a mysteriously entitled group called Digital Microfilm. These are digitized versions of microfilms of various record series. They include, for example, as you can see here in the slide, masses of home office correspondence from the period of the French Revolution. The conventional narrative of English Freemasonry during the period of the French Revolution is that its loyalty to crown and country was unquestioned and the difficulties created uh, by writers such as Robison and the Unlawful Societies Act of 1799 were fairly easily resolved. This was not the case. Browsing through the Home Office correspondence currently available for download, it's clear that Freemasonry caused the government much anxiety and that the Home Office kept a very close eye on it. 
The digital microfilm packages are not easily searchable, uh, but these you have to read through them as if you were reading microfilm. Um, but nevertheless, these home art office archives have never been systematically examined by historians of Freemasonry. And this is a real opportunity uh, to take a closer look at them. And the Home Office papers suggest that the story of Freemasonry in Britain was at this time just as fraught as it was in France uh, and elsewhere in Europe. And that the, the, the French Revolution uh, and the demand for radical reform associated with it caused as many shockwaves um, in English Freemasonry as it did over the Channel. In 1795, for example, the Master and Brethren of the Lodge of Affability at Brentford, near London, were accused of plotting against the King's life, and a King's messenger was sent to investigate the allegations. In this letter to the Duke of Portland, the Secretary of State, the Lodge protested its innocence and demanded that the person responsible for the allegations should be arrested. The Home Office papers also reveal that at the time the British government was trying to outlaw closed meetings under the Unlawful Societies Act of 1799, it was receiving allegations from Masonic informers that Masonic meetings were being used for the purposes of radical plotting. James Green, a lawyer in Leeds, sent this letter to the Duke of Portland, describing how at a lodge meeting in Scotland, he had heard Freemasons expressing strong support for what he described as the Cannibalian government in France, and had been invited to meetings of Irish radicals uh, taking place under cover of Masonic meetings, and Knights Templar seemed to have been a particular uh, cover for this. Green went on to assure the Duke that, as I am of the higher orders of masonry, he could be of great service to the government in infiltrating Masonic meetings and detecting such Masonic plots. Green was a member of the Philanthropic Lodge in Leeds. In February 1799, a group of men making counterfeit coins were arrested in Yorkshire. Green alleged that the master of the philanthropic lodge, James Bentley, was the ringleader of the counterfeiters. He wrote enthusiastically to the Duke of Portland as Secretary of State with information about Bentley and arranged for Bentley to be expelled from Freemasonry. Green forwarded a copy of the relevant minutes of the philanthropic lodge uh, uh, in Leeds to the Secretary of State. Such activities were highly prejudicial to Freemasonry in Britain at a time when it came close to being outlawed. The dangers are evident from documents relating to other fraternal societies in the Home Office papers. As part of the Home Office investigation of groups holding closed meetings, a copy of the rules of the United Order of Old Fellows was obtained and reviewed by the Home Office. We can see from the file copy how Home Office officials went through and systematically removed all references to ritual and to secrets, stripping the odd fellows of their ritual heritage. Such political and legislative intervention is important in understanding the different paths of development of different <coughs> fraternal organisations. I hope I've said enough to whet your appetite for using this period of lockdown to research some of the vast quantities of information available online. Only a small amount has been digitized. The guess is that only about 5% of the collections of bodies such as the British Library and National Archives have been digitized. But as I think I've shown, um, there are huge quantities of unexplored material like the Home Office papers available online. I've mainly concentrated on encouraging you to look at primary materials, but in finishing, it's worth mentioning that a number of journal publishers are, during the period of the pandemic, making online academic periodicals available for free and waiving their normal charges. Here's a list of some of the publisher sites that are currently free. Um, many contain interesting secondary articles and books, even MIT Press, uh, to my surprise, had some interesting uh, material on Freemasonry. So I think uh, my message is, for uh, while we have offers like that of the uh, National Archives and of these publishers available uh, during the lockdown, take advantage of them 
uh, while you can. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Nobody else can talk except me, so uh, so I'm just I, I'm having to fix that for everybody. I I have um, a, a few good questions, um, maybe maybe more than we have time for, but let me let me get started. And if you if you haven't had a chance to type your question in yet, please do send it to the host. Um, so the first question here asks whether there's a difference between the old and the ancient charges that you mentioned. Oh, the, um, uh, um, no. Um, I mean, basically what Roberts published, um, and this is a conflict that we haven't really explored enough. What happened was that we know that the old charges were fundamental um, in meetings with Masons, um, from, well, at least probably the 17th century, 16th, 17th century. They were the sort of warrant that enabled uh, meetings to take place. Um, we know that the appearance of the Cook manuscript was very instrumental in the formation of Grand Lodge. And the, the fact that George Payne appeared with it in 1721 was fundamental um, in the uh, uh, creation of Grand Lodge. That precipitated... Anderson being told to revise and bring them up to date and straighten them out. Um, and it's clear that some people like Roberts thought that Anderson was engaging in a kind of farrago um, and disliked that and felt that, that they should stick with the old charges as the ancient form of the constitutions. Okay. And that's why Roberts both publishes that and pub publishes um, uh, that advertisement. So, uh, yeah, the old charges are the ancient form. Okay, good, good. So here's another one, uh, and I think you just answered this, actually, and that is when we're speaking about digitizing old documents, and, and I, I guess the, the, the querent really wants to know about old Masonic documents, what, what percent are, are still not digitized? It's not only that, I mean, there's a huge amount that's not digitized. If we kind of think about the newspapers, uh, we've got this huge package that we all use called the Burning Newspapers. And recently, a, a complimentary collection in the Bodleian Library formed by a man called John Nichols has become available online. We kind of think they're comprehensive. But when you look at um, the newspaper, newspaper collections that people like Robbins will use, you realize that actually a lot hasn't yet been done. Um, and for the newspapers, for the 18th century, you're probably still probably only got about 50% available online. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot, a lot to be done. When you look at something like the old charge documents, if I'm thinking about ancient documents like that, not only, I mean, we've got Cook and Regis, but not only has very little of that been digitized, we don't actually even know where a lot of it is. Um, the uh, the cataloging and keeping of information about that has been very haphazard, and we're reliant on very old uh, catalogs. Um, uh, in some cases, we're reliant on information that Hugh and Gad had gathered in the eighteen nineties, and we just kind of don't know where the manuscripts even are, let alone digitised. Yeah. They're out so, there. Somewhere. So, so here's a question. We've gone out, we do, we do our research, we write something. Are there copyright issues for the open resources in terms of publishing? Uh, varies. Copyright is a very fraught, it's a very, very fraught area. Um, uh, um, the, 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 the simple answer is always to refer back to the repository um, uh, in order to, to check um, the if you're publishing a large amount of that in order to check what the situation uh, is. Um, if, you, if you're taking something like, for example, state papers, there are provisions in the UK called Crown Copyright, which means that if a lot of the stuff isn't in the sort of public domain idea that you have in the United States, mm -hmm. it's actually controlled by the Crown and there are various regulations um, that restrict that. Um, there are the issues around um, issues around uh, the way you use images as well. So yeah, I mean, it's a very fraught area. It's not one we can easily summarize here. But the best advice is always check with your local librarian or archivist. And indeed, 
Um, if you're based in the UK or you want to do it by the, the library and archive staff at the Museum of Freemasonry are all experts in this area and very happy to advise. So the next question here is, is, is one more, I think, about funding libraries uh, and archives. And, and this is if, you're, if we're drumming up all this extra traffic uh, for their online resources, do, do libraries get credit for us being visitors or do we have to be there physically? The big one of the big problem. I mean, it, it, many libraries are suffering from a shortfall, and how you balance out um, the need to maintain a presence on the ground against developing your digital resources is one of the biggest problems librarians and curators face um, at the moment. The the most important contribution that I think everyone can make um, is to actually credit the digital resource when you're using it. Big problem. I didn't mention the partly because I mentioned it too often in the past, the big old Bailey um, uh, 18, collection of 18th century criminal trials that are a wonderful resource of social history. And the, one of the biggest problems they have, an enormously successful site, is that people use information but don't say really where they got it from, mm -hmm. um, don't credit site enough. I think everyone involved with digital resources, so the most useful thing you can do is to say where you got it from. Um, because then that does build the case for further funding if you can demonstrate uh, what use is being made of it. We have a lot of questions here on um, where where to point researchers who are looking um, at, at, at specific categories of records, uh, overseas lodges, pre-union rituals, uh, uh, military records. Um, where can I, well, you I, well, I didn't that? really talk about military records, but if you go on to the National uh, from the UK, you go on to the National Archives website, you'll see one of the richest of uh, the it, the list of digital resources. Some of them, for contractual reasons, are still only accessible via something like Ancestry or Find My Past. But if you look at the ones that aren't flagged as only accessible in that way in the National Archives list, you'll see a lot of the ones that are available for free are actually kind of military records. Um, and that's one of the richest areas in the National Archives. So for that, that would be a very good start. Some of the more specialist uh, Masonic material, um, uh, you might well be advised um, to look at uh, something like um, the it, while if one's looking purely online, something like the Internet Archive or the Hathi Trust, um, which is a very useful sort of consolidated catalogue uh, available online, because you'd kind of be looking, if you're not actually going to look at it at Great Queen Street or another Masonic Archive, which would be the obvious place for that, then they, they would be good starting points. So I have a question here. I, I'm not exactly sure what the 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 question asks i'd like to ask you to explain more on the subject of pop cultural versions of some resources um would whoever asked that send another send a clarification i think um and and here's one have lodge archives been digitized in britain only in a very limited way and in fact i've got um uh, uh, I've got a set of CDs on my shelves um, of a, a lodge in Birmingham that had minute books going back to the early 19th century, um, which which they did a very good job um, of digitising um, back in back into the early 2000s, uh, which is really very useful. I've always thought one of the biggest things, given everybody's interest and enthusiasm uh, in Masonic research, one of the best things that we could look for. Um, would be a lot of people editing um, Masonic Lodge records or making them available in some form. It doesn't have to be digitized. The transcript is often even more useful than a, um, than a series of images. Um, but I, I do think, I always thought that's kind of an area where we could, it would be really useful to see a, a much more concerted effort to actually edit Lodge records on a large scale. Well, I think... I've run out of questions. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh. Uh, so, so Andrew, thank you very much. That was a brilliant way to start this lecture series. 
Well, thank you, thank you, everybody, for arranging. Oh, good evening. So, can, can everyone go away? I, well, I will just say I, I if we're unable to keep track of everything going through, um, I've prepared, and they will be distributed afterwards, a list of all the URLs I mentioned in the, in the talk. And obviously, of course, the PowerPoint will also be available. So if anybody wants to, well, basically, I just encourage people to play around with some of the things I mentioned, that's all. And, and thank you very much to our audience. I, I lost track of how many people were there, but but please come back. Oh, yeah, yeah, 140. That's great. Thank you so much. And it's well, nice well, to see you. so many familiar faces there. Well, I can still see Neil there. Um, we've lost Claudio somewhere. Uh, uh, Claudio, we've lost the, the thing. But, uh, Hi, Susan. Uh, Hi, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's great. Right. Ciao, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.